and reverently this morning and, and gra with gratitude in our hearts and a song of praise in our hearts for what you've already done. <clears throat> and Father, I ask as I usually do because I mean it sincerely from the bottom of my heart. I want to see it in the people. Open the eyes of the understanding of our inner man. To see with diamond point precision the clarity of your word and open the ears of our inner man to hear with diamond point precision the truth of your word and let the seeing and the hearing merge together in, the, in, in our hearts of the inner man in an effusion of explosive revelation of who you are. Yeah. And then give us a, a living understanding of it by showing us how to apply that revelation in our lives or, or use it in ministry however you see fit thereby giving us that living understanding because it sets it into us so we never forget it, lest we sin and, and hold it in our heads as a form of God with no power and eventually lose it. So help us this morning, Father. Help us. I am desperate for people to know these things, Father. So help me deliver this morning's message as the pen of a ready writer under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and let the people that hear it that are here, see it and hear it with an anointing that gives them a living understanding, a living revelation of, of your word, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. I'm going to pick up where I left off last week. We're talking, uh, we're talking about hope and faith and why people have faith failures because in the end, in Hebrews 11, 6, God says that without faith it's impossible to please Him. He doesn't say without hope it's impossible to please Him. He says without faith it's impossible to please Him. But now I'm going to put the twist on this, and it's in the Word. I'm going to just back up just a little bit to help segue off into the other. If you look at Romans 5, 5 in the King James, it, says, it starts out saying, Hope maketh not ashamed. But in the, in the actual Greek, the more literal translation of that, hope does not disappoint. How many has been disappointed? Oops. Everybody did look around. Uh, Margie, everybody didn't raise a hand. Go cast the devil out of them or something. I don't know. <laughs> of course we have. We've all missed it in that respect. And, one, and this is why a lot of people say, oh, that faith stuff just doesn't work. Why? Because James 2.17 says, Faith, being by itself alone, is what? Dead. Stone cold graveyard, deader than a hammer. That's my version of it. Faith is dead. In other words, you might, have kept, might as well have kept your mouth shut and not said anything or done anything because you had no living hope for your faith to be the substance of in Hebrews 11.1. 1. What I want to show you, what I'm attempting to find the language for, we started last time. Hope is for things, for something, in and through someone. And hope, I, don't, I never did like vines or any of the expository dictionaries definitions of hope. And I asked God about this one time, and he told me what his hope is. He said, hope is simply seeing yourself living in my perfect will for your life based on what my son did on the cross. But if you can't see it, you ain't going to do it. It'll never happen. Living in God's perfect will for your life based on what Jesus did on the cross. Based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's most important. That's the underlying basis of faith. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, 2, and 3, I give unto you first of all that which I first received, namely that Jesus Christ was killed, he was dead, then he was buried, and then he was resurrected. That's the apostolic foundation. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the centerpiece of everything else that the gospel revolves around. St. Paul from the trenches said it's the uh, heart and soul of the gospel. The heart and soul of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the guy that wrote this translation of, of 1 and 2 Corinthians, he never got to finish it because he was a, a British soldier in the trenches of World War I. 
and he was killed before he could finish the work. But he finished, I'd say, two-thirds or three-fourths of it, and his family found his papers years and years later and got to read it and realized what they had and got it published. It's called St. Paul from the Trenches in the honor of the one who wrote it. And it's absolutely mind-blowing because it's a, it's a revelation by the Holy Ghost. The heart and soul of the gospel. Others say it's the first importance, the greatest importance, uh, so forth. But that's the one that gripped my heart when I said it, the, when I, I read it. The heart and soul of the gospel. You don't know who you are in Christ and who God and Christ are in you. <laughs> You're a dead duck. <laughs> it's just all over. A lot of people say Jesus is Lord, but they don't believe it in their heart. Guess what? They ain't going to make it. The requirement is that you believe in your heart the revelation that Jesus is Lord, Redeemer, King of Kings, Savior, Creator of the universe, and your personal Lord of Lords, and then confess that. Put it into action by confessing it and say, Lord, come into my life and, be in, and live in me. That's why Jesus said, those, uh, the, these people came to him and said, Lord, Lord, did we do all this stuff in your name? He said, get away from me, I don't know you. Because you haven't what he was saying was, we have no relation. We have no, I have no relationship with you. I don't even know what you did or who you are. Go away. That sounds, that's hard. I don't care. It's the God's economy. He's the one that laid down the roof for salvation. You didn't. I didn't. I wouldn't think so. Why did he say get away from me? Yeah. So, and we, we saw that hope, uh, I hope, and Psalms is full of it, it says, I hope in you, my hope is in you. Hope in God, hope in God, I hope for. Uh, uh, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Uh, there's hope for your future, the hope of glory. Hope does not disappoint, we just said that. Uh, now this, uh, I, I, there's a relationship here I want you to see. The hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters behind the veil. doesn't say faith enters behind the veil. It says hope does. Now, see, I like these oops. I can title every teaching I do is oops. <laughs> and then you can figure out what the rest of it for yourself. Hebrews 7.19 says, By a sure and steadfast hope we enter within the veil. doesn't say by we enter within the veil by faith. Yet it's impossible to please God without faith. So what does this tell you? Now listen to me carefully. And then we, uh, people misunderstand the, the writings of, uh, in John 14 and, and 15 and 16 where it says, uh, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will I do, that the Father may be glorified in me. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And if you abide or live in me, and my words abide or live in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you by the Father. Abide is a living. If you live in me, and my words live in you, this, in, this implies that you have a living under revelation and understanding of God's word. And that lives in you. You have a revelation of who you are in Christ. Gee, Colossians 1.27, Christ in you is the hope of glory. doesn't say faith is in you the hope of glory or the way to glory or whatever. Christ in you is the hope of glory based on what he did at the cross, based on his death, burial, and resurrection. Now we come to the faith part. There are no verses in the Bible that I know of, and, and Sharon and I studied this out and looked at it, it says faith for anything. Faith for salvation, but what is salvation? Not stuff. It's not stuff. Salvation, if you study out the word salvation in Greek, there's five main areas that it covers. It covers uh, uh, salvation of your soul. It covers temporal and spiritual deliverance. It covers healing. It covers your prosperity. It co everything. Look it up. Now, that's one place you do need. 
and the, and the Greek word for salvation in Greek is sozo. It pretty much covers the whole package. You can't have faith in salvation. You must have faith for salvation, and everything flows out of that because Christ is our salvation. Christ in us is our hope of glory. We, folks, we've been, Sharon and I have been majoring in this for 25 years. We've seen people come and go and wondered why and, and over the years. Ministers that you think were bright stars and they were just flashes in the pan. And the Lord spoke to us one day. He said, because they don't know who I am in, in them. Your salvation cannot be based on an apostle or a prophet, or a pastor, or a teacher, or an evangelist. None of the gifts of the Spirit, or none of the administrative gifts can be, none of these were given to validate the ministry of those men. Amen, amen, amen. Yes. This is where the church has gotten it all turned around. Even the original apostles. And this is, where, this is the first place that the enemy got in and perverted the word. They think, well, when the last apostle died, well, that was it. And we think, well... You just We imagine this line going up to everybody here, and you're the last apostle, and, and you're, you're, you're breathing your last. You're just, you're just breathing a death rattle. You're about to go and, and reach out for, to, for him to touch you and heal you, and all of a sudden you just slump over dead and say, well, that's it, no more. <laughs> How stupid can you get? The gifts of the Spirit and the administrative gifts and the pastoral, uh, the uh, uh, fivefold ministry gifts were given to the church. Like just 12 men. And this is where this is where the church has gotten everything screwed up. That's where it started. Thinking that all of this supernatural stuff was to, to validate these original apostles and things like that. Get off it. As Pastor Kenny says, get over yourself. Now, so there's not any verses for practical faith saying faith for anything. We were brought up in the, we came in at the height of the crest of the wave in the faith movement. Well, I mean, it's Kenneth Hagin camp meetings every summer for vacation and all that. And, and it was great. We learned a lot, but we also learned from various ones. That, well, if you want faith for healing, go look up the healing scriptures and study them out and, and, and get a revelation on that. If you want to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break that myth here in just a minute. I'm just going to blow it higher and up. If you want faith for prosperity, go study out the, 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 the talents in, the, in, in, in the Mark chapter 4 about, about how to grow a garden, about tithing and so forth. If you want faith for something, go study it out in the Scripture. Well, we did that, and some, we saw answers to some things, but most things we didn't. And we woke up one day and felt like the rug had been pulled out from under us. Just felt desolate and empty and didn't know where to go next. And I said, Lord, there's something bad wrong here. Something is terribly wrong here. Watch this. Follow me along. You can get the CD. Mark 11, 21, 22, and 23. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Oops. Didn't say have faith in something. He said have faith in God. Now, wait, yeah, not for things. Faith in God. Now, follow me. Truly I say to you, whoever says, declares to this mountain. What did the prophet Isaiah say? That God has declared the, 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 the end from the beginning. I, li I still like that. That's, I love that. That's just growing light on me. Be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says is going to happen and it will be granted to him. Now, you've heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again until you get it. If you're praying about something, praying for something, if, you've got, if you're desperately seeking answers for, for something, now, be specific as you can be. God knows your plight, your problem, your situation, your circumstance, whatever's involved. But you need to verbalize it to him. 
correctly. He said in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, says, and this is the confidence that we have before our Father, that if we ask Him anything according to His will, we know we have it. See, you have to learn to compare Scripture with Scripture. When Jesus said, if my word abides in you, and you abide in my word, if you live, my word lives in you, and you live in my word, you can ask what you will, my Father. Okay, the condition for that is over in 1 John 5, 14, 15. That's the instruction, according to his will. That's the most important, according to his will. That's the most important four words in that verse. And the scripture tells you, yes, sir, that's plain. That's plain. That's plainly spoken by the Spirit of God to the apostle who wrote that. We're not saying Brother Hagen or Brother Copeland were teaching it incorrectly. We did incorrect things with what? We did some screwy stuff with that thing. That stuff was back the then. problem. Brother Hagen was teaching this from Mark. He was teaching it from his heart. But and then people got off in the name it and claim it. That's right. And, and fell flat on their face, and there were thousands walking the streets of the country, even the world, wondering what happened. <clears throat> now, the interlinear Greek New Testament of Mark 11:22. And answering Jesus is saying, now you got to remember, this is written in a different uh, style of language because there are no conjunctions, if, ands, or buts, and stuff like that in the Greek. The Greek reads a little different. It's, 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 it's very bold, straightforward, and upfront. Be ye having belief of God. So even our belief has to come from him? Remember what Mark 11, 23, uh, 21, 2, and 3 says? Believe in your heart. Not doubting. And this is something else. You know, Willie Nelson's got a song. I love old Willie. <laughs> He's got a song out that says, I've got a picture in the back of my mind of what I've lost and what I've won. He still remembers the things of his failures so on and so forth. If you're praying about something, like I said a while ago, if you're believing God for something, and you've got a different picture of the outcome in the back of your mind, and you've got an if and all, I don't know, God, I don't know if that's going to happen, blah, 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 blah. you're dead before you ever get the prayer out your mouth. Your picture's wrong. If your picture's wrong, that means your hope is wrong. And if your hope is wrong, don't look for any faith to, to be there to, to, to be effectual in bringing it to pass. It's not going to happen. I'm just telling you. Don't like that, I don't care. <laughs> I didn't write that book. The Holy Ghost did. No. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> God just revealed this to me uh, this morning about hope, and I've, I've had a, a rough week, and I've had a lot of cloudy, uh, dark, you know, just blah feeling, you know, and, and anyway, God revealed to me that, that hope is not wishfulness. It's not wishful thinking. No, sir, it's not wishful it's thinking. It's a confidence that that you're going to be with God now, and then when you're gone from here, it's, it's a continuous thing. Thank you, Harley. Good. Now, Faith. Let's talk about faith. Man, I told you what hope was. Faith's a little bit harder to define, but if we find, if we look in the Word of God, we can find the necessary language for it. This is what we have to do. This is our personal responsibility for our personal selves and our family and our loved ones for our well-being. Look at Hebrews 1 3. You got to see this. Because our, co our, our concept about faith has been totally screwed up. 
good old southern boy Cajun vernacular, it's bass backwards. Hold yourself, Juanita. Take care of yourself. Reach over, Chris. Grab her quick. <laughs> Have you found it? And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power when he made purification of sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Jesus Christ. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. What did Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's the exact image of God. He's the icon of the Father, just like you have computer screen icon. You click on it and it opens up files, folders, and everything else. Everything that's in there is revealed to you. And upholds all things. Now, here's the part I want you to underline and, or, or bracket by the word of his power. Now, if it had said by the power of his word, it would have implied or meant that there would be different varying degrees of power on different parts of the word, depending on the context, the tenses, and all of that kind of stuff. That's not the way it says. It says the word of his power. God's power is the 100% center line by which we gauge and judge everything above and below. Why? Go to chapter 13, look at verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yes and forever. James, it says, there's no variation or shifting of shadow with God. In the Old Testament and some other places in Galatians, it says, I'm the Lord God, I change not. He's steady. He's the same God right now as he was 50 gazillion years ago. He's the same God right now as he will be so far in the future. You, your mind doesn't wrap around the figure that big. That's why now faith is. And you've heard me use this expression. Parade, small town USA like us. Rodeo parade, Thanksgiving parade, Christmas parade. You don't see where the parade starts a mile down on the, other, on the north edge of town. You don't see where the parade get off is down the Piggly Wiggly parking lot. All you see is what's passing by in front of you right now. Sitting up on the tailgate of your truck with a cooler full of whatever. <laughs> hey, this is, this is Louisiana, people. You, get, you cross over into the state of Louisiana, you walk into a totally culturally different world here. <laughs> this is redneck territory. For me. <laughs> this is the definition of redneck. I was born in Texas, raised in South Arkansas, but when we crossed the state line to come live to Louisiana, we thought, my God, what have we gotten into? <laughs> God loves rednecks anyway. <laughs> now, let me... Let me, let me explain this to you, and then I'm going to give you a, demonstra a, a, a good graphic explanation. What? Yeah. You don't see what's the whole parade. You can see it piecemeal, but when it passes by in front of you. And if you get there at the middle of it, then you've already missed the front of it. But you get up there in an airplane or a helicopter a thousand or so feet in the air and look down, you can see it all. You can see the beginning, the middle, and the end. You get God's perspective on it. You get what I call the God's eye view of the thing. And you have to, this is where discernment comes in. Of course, discernment zeroes in on an immediate thing, but sometimes it's more encompassing than that. And we have to be open to that. You see what I'm saying? I don't want to go, I don't really want to go there. But you've got to learn to see from where God sees it. And we've got to learn to take the cultural colored filters of our yeah. spiritual eyes off and the things that are wrong that we've learned wrong and that are filtering 
uh, spiritual information coming into us and, and converting it into something that we don't need or don't want and it's not correct. Yes. God's perspective. If you don't have God's perspective, your faith is going to be corrupted. If you don't have God's uh, per, uh, 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 inside on this thing uh, or whatever is confronting you, your hope is going to be corrupted. And nothing's going to work. You walk around like a cow to new gate. You'll never cross over into, into, into success in anything. There are no really differing, and, and this, is the, this is the view that I hold now. Faith is faith is faith is faith. God's de God parented his word. Romans says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. And we understand that that means by hearing with the eyes and seeing with the eyes of our inner man like I pray. We see with the eyes of God because he's the voice that parented the word voice behind the word that parented the word. God, God parented his word. That's why his DNA is in the word. And you can't say that about any other writings in the world. And we went into the fact that when we say the things of God and when we declare the end from the beginning, like John is healed. Or is it Don? Don. Don. Or whatever. That produces a sound that catches the ear of God. That is a sound that penetrates heaven. If you say, oh, I don't know if he's going to make this or not. That's, that's, well, this is bad. That never, God never hears that kind of junk. Amen. God doesn't hear it because it's the wrong sound. Yes. The words of the, the revelation of the word of God produces a sound out of the human heart that only God can hear, the angels can hear, and, 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 and that's what works. Yes. That's why things work. When you quote the word, when you declare the word of God, for any situation, you're declaring hope and you're adding your belief and your faith with it. God sees that. He hears that. He doesn't hear all that other garbage. If he don't hear it, he can't act on it. Faith is voice activated. And, that's, and, 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 and when you voice activate something, that's acting on the Word. That's the beginning of actions on the Word. It may require you to do something. Go over there and tell them this. Go yonder and tell them this. Go out yonder to Las Vegas, lay hands on this, on, on this yard bird out there on the street. Whatever God says, do. You have, and this way, you have, because of the revelation knowledge of God's Word in you, then you have the faith of God. You're having faith in God. You have the faith of God for the situation. You have faith for His will being done. <clears throat> Look up. You see lights. You see fans going. Coffee pot in there. Sound system gone. Even the little lights behind this sword thing in here. How hey, y'all like that? <laughs> Took her eight months to make this. And Mark, Mark did this. Mark got the sword fixed up there, and that's a real sword. It's not plastic. You got hit with it at cold cocky. This thing weighs about 20, 30 pounds, don't it? It's a good, it's a good seal, good illustration. Now, you see all of this. Uh, your stuff at home, your appliances. Anything that's powered by electricity. Your automobile. Without electricity, it ain't going to run. I don't care if you put an atomic bomb under the hood. It's got to be activated by electricity. Somewhere there has to be a generation plant for the power that we all use. Uh, 
a central place of power generation. And from there, transmission lines, it's generated by huge generators, some as big as this building. Hoover Dam's got about eight or ten of them in there with water going through them and turning against electronic, uh, electric armatures and things that's big around as these freight train engines out here that, that pass back and forth. Huge things. Generate enormous voltages and amperages. It goes out on these big old transmission lines that big around. Out to the surrounding cities and states. Takes 110 volts to turn these fans over. To cause these lights to brighten up. Run that coffee pot in there. What about the machinery of the plants out here? That's 110 volts coming into this building. At Arizona Chemical, we had we had we had uh, 440. We had 110. We had uh, our own power system out there. Power. Uh, distribution center out there, we had 110 for the office, but we didn't need anything bigger than that. The other parts of the plant, we had 220, double that. The other parts running big pumps, so big you couldn't reach around some of them, 440. And in one place, we had 880. But it was the same power generated by that one plant somewhere around wherever our power generation comes from. It's the same electricity. Some things require more than others. The only difference between that and faith is faith is faith is faith. Jesus said if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could move any mountain out of your life you needed to. Then he said, I came to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law. That's the smallest elements of punctuation in the Hebrew language. They're so small you can hardly see them with the naked eye. Well, you can't hardly see a, a mustard seed with the naked eye. It's just it's smaller than a fly speck. It's smaller than the head of a pen. If you didn't know what you was looking at, you'd never know it. That little measure of faith is all it takes to do what's needed. You see what I'm saying? Faith is simply believing God really has the power to do what he said he'd do. Hope. Now, I, I, I mentioned sound a while ago. Sound is a carrier wave for energy. Sea level. Ernst Mach, the Austrian scientist, back in the eight, late 1800s, determined the speed of sound at sea level, 750 miles an hour. In salt water, it's 4,000 miles an hour. At 39, 40,000 feet, it's only 600 miles an hour. Why is it when you stick your ear down to the steel track of a railroad, you can hear a train coming 30 minutes before it gets to your location? That's because sound from the pounding drivers of those engines travels at 16,000 miles an hour through that kind of steel. So what controls the transmission of sound is the density of the material it's being transmitted through. The speed of sound is determined by the density of the material it's being transmitted through. The more dense the material, the faster it goes. The reason, the reason, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, it may be so, maybe not. It may block something from getting in, too. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, that's good. I love it. It depends on what you're full of. That's good. <laughs> that's good. I don't care who you are. I love having fun like this. You know, a pastor friend of mine told me, he said, Tom, when I quit having fun doing this, I'm going to pack it up and go back to the house and stay there. So, the reason sounds only 600 miles an hour, 40,000 feet, because the air is less dense up there and there's not as many air molecules to transmit the sound. So it doesn't go as fast. We know now that stars, that when a star uh, collapses in on its core and explodes and then re-ejects all that material out into space as a nova, all of that explosive ejection 
The carrier wave for all of that energy are sound waves. Stars are as, as dense a material as you can get. Think about it. We now know that our own sun, from time to time, on a random basis, nobody knows why, emits a sound that's high, like you thump a tuning fork, high C above middle C. And we don't know why, but it does. It just does it. It's an elect it's a, it's, it, you wouldn't hear it as that, but it's picked up electronically and converted into that part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So there's sound out there. There's sound down here. Which would you rather have in your life, the sounds of heaven or the sounds of hell? The sounds of the light of the sun or, or, or the sounds of the darkness of demons? And how much, what kind of sound are you going to make in response? What are you transmitting? You can't transmit anything that's not in you. That generation plant on electricity can't transmit what's not, it can only transmit so much. And electricity that powers these fans and lights at 110 volts is the same electricity that's amped up and powers an 880 volt system. It's the same. Faith is the same. Faith is the same because it has the same source. God is the same. There's no shifting of shadow or turning or variation with God. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, forevermore. Faith is faith is faith. It's the same. If you knew how to work the jot and tittles that's in the Bible, my Lord, we'd all be in heaven by now. We'd be walking around down here healed, healthy, whole, unlimited resources. If we just knew how to work that. Grain, as a grain of mustard seed. Now do you see where I'm going? Faith is of God. It's in God. Hope is for things. Faith is in somebody. Hope is for things. Faith is in somebody. Hope is, here's how I liken hope. Hope is the searchlight that goes into heaven. Pokes around, looks around in there, says, oh, there's, 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 what, there's what, there's what, there's what, there's what uh, Karen's looking for, there's what Mark's looking for, right over there. Uh, okay, Faith, go over and get it. Faith is like that electricity. It's the same electricity that powers the whole power grid, flows through the whole power grid. Irregardless of what level of machinery it's operating, it's the same. It comes from the same source. Your hope and your faith come from the same source. But one is for something and one is in something. That's how we come to get that rendezvous several years ago. Because I was so happy, I was going to Shreveport to get our newsletter printed. And I was just happy and singing, worshiping and praising God. And I said, just slap the steering wheel and said, God, I can't wait to see how you're going to bring our next car in our procession. A month later, I had it. Wasn't even particularly looking for that one. He set it over in Carlisle and never would let it sell until I got there. There's more to that story than that, but anyway. <laughs> Acts 3, 3, 1 through 6, Dean. I'm not going to have time to read the whole, read the whole thing. Uh, this, this, uh, Peter and John were going to the temple and the, the beg lame beggar by the gate called Beautiful. I'm going to pick it up at verse 5. Uh, well, 3. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us! Why did he say that? He wasn't asking to look at them in the natural. He was saying, Focus on us. Focus on us. Give us your full attention. And then look what he, Peter said. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I don't possess any silver and gold. See, this guy was a beggar. He was looking for alms, for silver and for gold, for coppers or whatever, you know. That's how he made his living. He was, he was crippled from birth and he was a beggar. But what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene walk. And the, the guy didn't jump up right then. Peter reached down and took the guy by the hand like this and pulled him up to his feet 
The guy couldn't walk on his feet. His ankles were so weak they wouldn't support him. But when he pulled him to his feet, with that act of faith, God immediately strengthened that man, and he went into the temple with him, jumping and shouting and praising. And the people saw it, and I mean the revival was on. He said, what I do have, I give, I give to you. What do you have? Hope that you can be a normal human being again, <coughs> and faith that you will walk. Right now. Peter, people started running up to him and they were amazed. And so Peter says, you can pick it up again in verse 16, and on the basis of faith in his name. Not our name, his name, Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him, has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. Hallelujah. Did you get that? And on the basis of faith in his name. It is the name of Jesus which strengthened this man whom you see and know and the faith which comes through him. Peter had faith in God. And he simply, what I have, I give unto you all. I've got this faith in me. It's from God. Here, have a dose of it. Acts 20, 21, 20 and 21. How I did did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 24, 24. But some days later, Felix, who was a ruler, arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. He didn't sit there and... Say, well, I'm, I, when I get through, you're going to have faith for this and faith for that and this, that, and the other, and you can just have all the kind of stuff. You, no, he said, faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to me carefully. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Misplaced faith has been the author of more failures than you can count. Ephesians 9, uh, 3, 9 and 12, 9 through 12, well, 11 through 12. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. This, the Amplified says, this is in accordance with the terms of the eternal and timeless purpose which he has realized and carried into effect in the person of Christ Jesus our Lord. In whom, because of our faith in him, we dare have the boldness, the courage, and the confidence of free access an unreserved approach to God with freedom and without fear. Colossians 2.12 says, For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Faith in God. All right. Colossians 2.12 in translators. New Testament. When you were baptized, you were buried with him, and in union with him you were raised again because you believed that God who raised him from the dead really had the power to do it. And that's another place, that's another tripping point that people slip up on. When we pray, we don't know if God's really going to do what... You're hoping with no faith. You're wishing. You're wishing. And it's not wishing, you're being wishy-washy. It's doubting. What did Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, when you stand praying and believe? Not doubting. Standing firm in the faith. Not doubting. If you doubt, that means you really don't believe God's got the power to do it. 
Bada bing, bada boom. They, I mean, I didn't write this stuff. Galatians 2.20, and this is one of my very favorite verses. I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live. And the life I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. He loved himself and gave himself for me. The interlinear, <coughs> interlinear Greek says, Christ I have been crucified with, yet I, yet I live no longer. Uh, no longer I. It, the Greek reads, it's funny. But lives in me Christ. But that which I now live in flesh, in faith I live, that of the Son of God who loved himself and gave himself for me. Yeah. Most other reliable translational renderings say the same thing, but here's my favorite. It's the distilled Bible. I consider myself, as, as Galatians 3.20, I consider myself as having died and now enjoying a second existence, which is simply Jesus using my body. <laughs> I consider myself as having died and now enjoying a second existence, which is simply Jesus using my body. Bill Johnson says Christ is in you and he wants out. <laughs> 2.20. Tooth and two-o, or tooth and two-alt, however you want to say it. Still sounds right. <laughs> I'm through. <laughs> so... The basic difference I wanted everybody to see that hope is for things, for something in and through someone. And faith is faith for us is always in someone, of someone. It's not for. You're believing for better things because you have faith in the one who has the power to bring it to pass. You have hope that is the searchlight for faith. It's the carrier wave for the power of faith to go in there and bring it out of heaven and back into your possession. Bingo! That's it in a nutshell. Got to have real Bible hope based on what Jesus did at the cross. That's your searchlight that goes around and plunders heaven. Takes, that goes in <coughs> and penetrates the interface between this world and the heavenly world, the kingdom of heaven, God's domain. God sees that hope. If it doesn't get there, God doesn't see it. He ignores it. He'll pass over a million people to get somebody who's exhibiting real hope, and he's saying now, Let's see some faith with this hope. Let's see some faith with it because I want to give you everything I've got over here. He's rooting for you. But you're going to have to do it his way. You've got to have faith in him. So, God, I believe I receive right now in the name of Jesus whatever you're believing for according to your will. This is mine. I have it right now. I don't have it tomorrow. I didn't have it yesterday. I have it now. I have it right now. Right now. Now, and you may have to contend for that faith because all hell is going to try to stop it. That's why you fight the fight of faith. That's why it's called that. But it's a good fight. It's a fight that God honors and backs to the hilt. And it always has a good outcome for you. Didn't why use it? Duh. Wishy washy doesn't cut the mustard. And we need to learn the difference between real hope and wishing. There's there's hope and there's fantasy. 
Fantasizing over something is not going to bring it into your life. Fantasizing can get you in more trouble than you can think of. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just a terrible place. It'll lead you to some terrible things. Fantasizing is nothing. It's dangerous. The hope is real. Faith is real. We need to know the difference and how they work together to produce things from the kingdom into this earthly realm. Y'all get anything out of this?